chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 through 9. So Galatians 5, 1 through 9. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. <clears throat> ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. Again, it's good to see you here today. If you are visiting with us, thank you for being with us today. You're an honored guest, and I would love the opportunity to maybe get to talk to you after the service. And uh, just kind of thank you for coming and being with us. And if you're home, folks, we're glad that you're here too. And uh, I want to say thank you all for everyone. has been really nice to me uh, today, <laughs> yesterday. It was part of the ball game. One team showed up. One team showed up for 14 seconds. And so that's just kind of how it went. If you don't know anything about it, you're better for it. So uh, that's all right. But uh, I do want to just say this. And I know we're getting into the word here. But uh, these different things that we're doing, like this week, I know it's different. It's holidays. It's all that stuff that's going on. But we, we just want to spend some time together as a church, and, and if you're a part of our church, or if you're new to our church, we'd love for you to come. Like Tuesday night, it's just the time we get together. I know many people still working, a lot of things going, so we're just bringing some soup, stuff like that. And it's just a time that we get to fellowship, play some games together. Maybe some people will give some testimony, just the good things that God's done. And I think it's good for us to do that. And then, of course, next Sunday night, uh, for the ladies' appreciation, uh, all I can say is, ladies, we, we don't do this a lot as guys, so just take us up on it, okay? It's like a free meal. You don't have to do anything. We even clean uh, with that wash dishes, which we're watching videos on all week about how to do that, YouTube, and doing that kind of stuff. But uh, we're looking forward to that, all right? And it's great to have Greg and Robin back with us. Uh, they, they've been gone for yeah. a Years. minute, and they pop back in and go. I'm glad to have them with us, you know, serving the Lord, working and building that church uh, down there, New Life Baptist Church, where uh, Jonathan Redford and his family are down there in Tampa. And I know y'all get finished. Yeah. As finished as you're going to get. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's good. Well, we're glad to have them back. And uh, if you would, let's go ahead as we look into our passage. Uh, let's go, Lord, word of prayer first. God, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we truly want to count our blessings. Lord, I know in my own heart, I am prone every single day to think of the things that I don't have, the things that have gone wrong, maybe the pressures or the problems. God, if I'm honest, honest, even the people that might have not shown me the love that I felt like I wanted or needed, I got to pray you forgive me of that. And Lord, help us to sit back and just be amazed at all the goodness of God, all that you've done in our lives. Not everything is joyful, but God, you do say everything in our life is needful. I pray you help us in understanding and giving thanks for that. And Lord, for us, as we look at your word for the next few moments, I pray you would... Uh, Speak to us individually. Lord, give us exactly what we need in this moment. Uh, but God, I also pray you might give us something we might need down the road that we might store it in our heart. Lord, I don't know how people found their way in this room today. But God, I pray you meet them and give them exactly what they need. I pray you might just take me as your vessel, forgive me of sin, and to me of self. Thank you for all you do. May we make much of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. So we're in the book of Galatians, and we've been going through a series, walking through this book, and, and it seems like it's taken forever to get towards chapter 5 and 6, which are probably the more familiar uh, chapters of it. If it's not familiar, that's fine. Uh, but we have talked about a lot of things over the last several uh, weeks and months even, and talking about this idea that Paul is writing to this church. Paul's in prison, and he's the Apostle Paul, and he's in prison. He's writing to this church because there's been some things happen since he was there, since they come to faith in Christ, that's kind of drawn them away from the gospel. Now, when I use that term, the gospel, and I need to tell you something, that should no longer, if you're a believer in Christ, it should no longer be what I call like the junk drawer in your kitchen. You know what I mean by that? Anyone else got a junk drawer in their kitchen or somewhere else? You know what it is. If we need tape, it's probably in that drawer. If we need toothpicks, it's probably in that drawer. 
If I need 17 cents, it's probably in that drawer right there, okay? You know what I mean? It's got that junk drawer that you have. That junk drawer means it's anything and everything. But when we use the term the gospel, if we know who Jesus Christ is, then it kind of got to no longer be the junk drawer of being anything and everything. We need to start to have a clear understanding of what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. Now, that's important because there's a lot of things that kind of present themselves and parade themselves as the gospel that aren't ultimately the gospel. They may be important things, but they're not actually what the gospel is. In fact, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says what? The gospel is what? It's the power of God unto salvation. And then it's important that we know what the gospel is, not some shallow form of it, and what the gospel actually is. And that's what I really enjoyed about studying this book of Galatians, is it kind of lays out before you exactly what the gospel is. And, and if you're over here and you're saying, well, this is actually what I think the gospel is, and it's not, then, it's, then you're off. And so, and so the very first Sunday in Galatians, we simply really just talked about, and I'm not going to review everything with that, but, just, but it goes along where we're at today, we, we kind of discussed... Really, there's two great errors when it comes to what the gospel is. Two great errors that occur amongst church folk. And really all people when it comes to the gospel of Christ and when it's proclaimed. And, and let me just quickly kind of lay out what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, okay? You and I are sinners. Okay, I hope that didn't burst your bubble today, okay? Everyone in here sinned, everyone's messed up, right? We have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We don't measure up to the holiness and the perfect uh, this, if you would, that God requires. And by the way, that's not at our worst. That's even at our best. Even at our best, we do not measure up to the righteousness and the favor and justification of God Almighty that God needs. But God, because he loved us so much, sent his son, Jesus Christ, who we're going to celebrate the birth of here in the next month. He sent his son to what? Take all of that away. To take all of that away. To impute to us righteousness and because my righteousness and your righteousness is not adequate enough, so if you could check all the things on a box that a Christian does, read your Bible, pray, don't cuss a lot, kind of don't do this, don't do this, whatever those things, no matter what those things you do, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags, is that we still need a righteousness that goes well beyond our own, that exceeds our own, and we only get that in Christ because Jesus gives to us in salvation perfection. We take on the righteousness of God. doesn't mean I'm perfect, but when God looks at me, he no longer sees my efforts and my goodness and my sinfulness. He sees the perfection or the completeness of Christ. And on top of that, the cross, Jesus not only makes us perfect in the eyes of God, meaning when God looks at us, but he also takes away the wrath of God that's due upon us and our rebellion against him. So you say, what do you mean? Do you remember when Jesus on the cross, remember one of the things that he said? My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God the Father pours out his wrath that I deserved as being a sinful creature who's rebelled against him in my life for sinning. And he turns his back and he pours all the wrath due to me and due to you on his son. So Christ absorbs that. So why? So he can impute to us or he can give to us salvation. And in his resurrection, we see this great exchange that we call the great exchange is complete. And here's the most really spectacular part of all of this. You and I did absolutely nothing for it. You and I did absolutely nothing for it. And, and I need you to understand that, that God saved you, God rescued you, God opened up your heart, God revealed this to you. You played no part in your salvation other than glad submission and receiving the gift of salvation. I know some of you might disagree with me and say, no, Phil, I walked down an aisle one service on a Sunday. I shook my pastor's hand. He, he said some things to me, repeat this after me, and I said it back to him. And, and that's what I did. And, and here's what I would tell you. Biblically, you got saved in your seat before you ever got up. That's right. Okay? Because that's the reason you got up. Because God wooed you and, and was speaking to you. Now, it's wonderful for you to get up, get out of your seat, go pray. I, I get that. But I'm telling you, the only reason you got up out of your seat, the only reason you in that nervousness, white knuckledness, said, excuse me, excuse me, walk down the aisle, is because God probed your heart and says, accept my gift of love. Accept my gift of love. That's what it was. So, and that he opened up your heart there in your seat to want to love him and to want to follow him, even though you probably had no idea, and we still don't just say fully what all that means to do that. So our justification and our salvation occurred while you're sitting in that seat. Because here's what I need you to understand, and this is not the main part of the message, but I need you to get this. But if you 
are saved because you have to repeat a prayer, that's sorcery. That's not Christianity. If it's just repeat what I say, there is no trust. There is no accepting the gift of God. It's like, what do I have to do in that? So that's a mantra, and God is not controlled by mantras. You were saved in your seat. So the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. God loves us, God saves us, and we accept that gift. It's kind of like at Christmas time, right? I mean, I kind of love this idea, but when Christmas Day comes and my kids come to get gifts, and, and, and I look at one of my kids and I say, hey, here's your gift, and they open the gift, man, thanks, Dad, this is awesome. And, of course, they're going to know that Mama actually gave it all to them. They all, my kids open every gift, by the way, and I always look at Rachel and say thank you. And I'm just like, I'm just here, man. I mean, they did all that. But if, imagine if they opened the gift, loved it, and I said, cool, that'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> Some of your parents like, new tradition at Christmas. Okay. <laughs> it ceases to be a gift, right? Because now they have to do something, pay for something, to receive it. And it no longer becomes the free gift of God. It's no longer a gift. You receive what God has done in your life. So despite me, despite you, and all the best efforts we might make, God saves us and God adopts us, makes us sons and daughters. And so not only do you have a just judge who declares you and I holy, blameless, and spotless, but you have an adopting father who delights in you and cares for you deeply. Can I say some, type, some people never understand and accept that part? Well, God saved me, but man, there's no way God loves me and delights in me. And when people hear that's the gospel, they're prone to one of two errors, okay? Maybe they don't start in these areas, but they tend to drift. In. And here's the first error is this. First error is this. When they hear that's the gospel is this, they think that's just too easy. That's just too easy. That's the first error a lot of people go to. So Jesus died. Jesus did all this. He loves me. He saves me. I just got to receive. I got to accept the gift of God. They say, man, that's just too easy. There's just no way. All I have to do is believe and trust in Christ and I'm saved and made holy. There's nothing, there, there's no way that, that could be true. There's nothing I have to do with it. Surely I have to help God out. Surely I got to do it. So what ended up happening is you get this whole group, and you've probably seen some of it before, of evangelicals or what we call Jesus plus. Jesus plus. Meaning this, it's got to be, to go to heaven, I got to accept Jesus, but I plus got to do these behaviors. I got to do Jesus plus something in their life. Those behaviors really, honestly, are probably built out of however you were raised, if you have much church background at all, or however you're raised, uh, as far as how you're brought up. So if you're in kind of this hyper-legalistic church, then the idea of Jesus plus something could be a slew of things, right? <laughs> Jesus plus doing these things, but Jesus plus don't do those things right over here, right? Like Jesus plus going to these places, but, but don't go to those places, because a Christian don't go to that place, so you must not be saved. It could be something as simple as this. Jesus plus these movies, but not Jesus plus those movies, right? You're right? I don't know how many you grew up, you know, PG all day long. G, just stood for God. We could watch that as a cartoon. It was great, right? We like, Anything higher than that, we're starting to smell like smoke a little bit. We're going to the bad place. Because they put all these things in life, right? Jesus plus that, right? Jesus plus this kind of language. Jesus plus baptism. And the Bible teaches clearly, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are baptized in the idea as identifying with Christ, what Christ has already done. is Jesus plus going to church, right? And what happens, all these, all these things are good things, right? But if we're not careful, this error is Jesus plus something. And Paul said at the very beginning of the book of Galatians, you can look it up in chapter 1, we won't take time to read it, but he said this, if anyone preaches a gospel other than the one I'm proclaiming to you, other than Christ, in Christ alone, that we are saved by faith alone, through grace alone. You know what Paul says? If anyone preaches anything else, Jesus plus something, Paul actually says, let him be accursed. It's pretty strong language. He even goes on to say, if an angel comes to you and says, hey, do this too, he says, let him be accursed. So really, the thing we need to settle on here is that Jesus plus something else for your salvation is not the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's not that. And then there are other people who don't necessarily walk in that particular area, they don't tend to drift that way. Instead, uh, people do this. And this is the second error. Is that they hear that the gospel is a free gift of God. And they say, oh, you mean Jesus will forgive me no matter what? You mean no matter what I do, God's going to cover it because of Jesus? Man, then here's what they say. The second error is, I'll just do whatever I want. If all I got to do is say some prayer and go to heaven, or all I got to do is trust Jesus, then the second error is, I'll do whatever I want and Jesus has to forgive me. So 
Now I want you to know that whole demographic of people that normally think that way, if they're not careful, are people who attend church, but ultimately their lives have never been transformed by Christ. <clears throat> church is just something you do. Reading the Bible is just something you do. Praying before a meal is something you just do. But your life has never been transformed in any way. There's no real affection for Christ. There's no submission to that. You simply go to church, call yourself a Christian, and just trust one day Jesus is going to cover all of that because he said he would. Right? And Paul's saying, yeah, that's not the gospel either. That's not the gospel either. So you have these two great errors, and the book is going to start to really turn a little bit here as we get to chapter 5. And I don't know if you picked up on it if you've been here several weeks, but the first four chapters were basically Paul saying the same thing over and over again. So we're like, yeah, Phil, I was here. And so he's kind of the same thing over and over again, and he's just kind of pounding it into their minds, into their hearts. So now the book's taking a little bit of a shift, and I really think it's spectacular. So Galatians chapter 5, if you've got a Bible there, if you don't have a Bible, there might be a black-covered one there in front of you. But we're going to pick it up in verse 1. And if you're visiting again with us, I just want to tell you a little bit what we do. We read a little bit, and then we talk a little bit. We read a little bit, and we talk a little bit. That's how we do, okay? Look at uh, verse number one. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, or I'm going to use the word freedom because it's the same. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of freedom, wherewith Christ has made us free. Now stop for a second. Now if you're thinking, Phil, how many verses are we getting through? Trust me, we'll, we'll do a bunch of them here in order, okay? Some of you panicking already. All right? All uh, right. But here's what I want you to know. This is important. There are sentences in the Bible that if you really get it, if you really get it, the Holy Spirit has the ability to open your heart and change everything if you really get it. And can I tell you what we just read is one of those sentences. Because here's what he said again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. You know what he just said? For freedom, Christ has set you free. For freedom, Christ has it sets you free. So I want to kind of explain this backwards, okay? So we have been set free. We talked about salvation, right? We have, we've been set free by the gospel of Christ, by the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ. We have been set free. So we uh, followed kind of this narrative of the book, right? The, what we have been set free from, right? If I asked you what you've been set free from, I would say there's a few things that Galatian teaches that we have been set free <laughs> from, right? We've been saved from. One of those is this. We've been set free from empty religion. We've been set free from empty religion. And, and I hope you're with me. We're set free from an empty religion, a passionless religion, an empty type of nuance, and meaning this. I've got to do these things, but I really don't want to do them. I've got to do these things because they're just rituals and routines. I've got to do this. There's no joy in it. There's no life in it. There's no passion in it. Don't think I'm talking about personality types here, okay? I'm not talking about personality types. we got all types of personalities here uh, in our church. Because uh, here's what I mean. This doesn't mean a lifeless, meaning you have a different personality. Because I know some of you, at the pinnacle of your excitement, look like me taking a nap. Okay? I get that. I get that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's you Hallmark movie people. You know what I mean? You're crying at the opening credits. <laughs> And they're all the same. I'm going to talk to <laughs> every one. It's the same. You know what I mean? It comes on. And this woman's going to have to go to this different town for a little bit because of work. She needs to get away. And there's going to be this great guy who's been through some kind of trauma in his life. And he's going to be by himself. And he's going to be out chopping wood in the woods, in the mountains, because that's what he does. And as he's out there chopping, and here comes this girl, and she comes, and he... And she kind of catches his eye, and of course she's not interested in that because she has to get away, and she's frustrated with work and all that stuff. And the whole time you're just sitting there basically screaming at the TV, oh, just love her, oh, just love him. And you're just talking to the TV like many of us did yesterday during the game. And so you're doing all those different things, right? You're doing all those things. And then you finally see where he shows interest in her, and then she's not really interested. And you're like, oh, you dummy. I would love him. I would love a man to chop wood and stuff. But whatever it would be, okay? <laughs> like that. And then you turn around, and, and then she shows interest, and it looks like it's about to happen, and something unforeseen happens. And it causes them to be separated for a second. And then finally at the end, the snow starts falling. They kiss, and life is great. And you wiping snot and tears, and you're just like standing up. And in three and a half minutes, they're going to show the same thing in a different state with different act. It's the same thing, man. Some of you, you're just like, that just touched me. That just so touched me. That is so my life. So there's some of you on that end of the spectrum. And there's some of you 
This is about as excited as you get. We're looking at me right now. I get it. So we got, we're not talking personality types, okay? Some of you are like, I can't wait for homework. Okay. okay. But what I'm saying, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about a state of the heart where there's no joy within for what you do in living for God. There's no joy in that. And can I tell you, there should be an immense amount of joy in religion if it's the religion of the Bible. Amen. Okay? So empty religion would be a joyless, lifeless practice of religion that's not hemmed in or <coughs> personal work to Jesus. It's just kind of religious about being religious. But also what we have been saved from is not just empty religion. And this is probably where we're going to really drive a lot today. We'll come back in a moment to it. But number two is this. We have been saved from fear-based behavior modification. Okay, we've been saved from fear-based behavior modification. So, this is very important. And let me kind of help you with this. The reason so many of us are trying to be better. So many of us are trying to be better. We're, we're trying not to do these things. Instead, we're trying to do these things. If we're honest, it's really all motivated out of fear. It's motivated out of fear. If, if I don't do this and I don't go here, if I don't say this and I don't do this, God's going to get me. If we're honest, we wouldn't say it out loud. That's the mentality in our heart, right? Because you kind of have this mentality, especially if you're my age or older, right? I know what my dad would do if I didn't do what he said. I can't imagine what an infinite sovereign God would do since he knows everything about me. I can't imagine what's going to come to my life and after this life if I don't do this. So everything driving you is in your behavior or how you modify that behavior is fear. And the Bible says we have been set free from empty religion, but we've also been set free from fear-based behavior modification. And if we're going to stay true to the book of Galatians, not only have we been set free from fear-based behavior modification, but we've also been set free from the vain pursuit of pleasures that never deliver what they promise. And if I could say that more simply this, we are saved or we're set free from being our own God. We're set free from being our own God. Now, in the 25 years I've been in ministry in my life, I've never had anyone walk up to me and say, you know what? I think I'm my own God. I think I'm my own God. I've never heard anybody say that, but I've met thousands of people who have lived that way. So here, let me explain that. So when you're your own God, you put an impossible amount of weight and pressure on yourself for everything in life. How your kids turn out, how your money turns out, how your health turns out how the day goes, how other things go, you have to be in control. And we won't raise hands, but if we're not careful, can I tell you, the idol of control is a miserable idol. It will make you miserable. It'll give joy for a moment, but it's like trying to hold water in your hands. It will not last. And that's what it means. You're like, well, I don't really want to be in control, but if everybody just did what I told them to do, life would be good. You're kind of going down that route, okay, with that. Because here's the deal. If you're your own God, you have to have to answer all the big questions. <clears throat> You've got to have to answer all the big questions and the questions that gnaw on you, like what's your purpose in life? And, and tell me our culture is not trying to answer that question. So we seek it in work. We seek it in relationships. We seek it with children. We seek it in accomplishment. We seek it in any areas uh, where it does not work out in our life. Huh? I mean, what do you do with suffering? in your life or where things happen in your life because that's a part of everyone's life or it's coming for you and that you have to figure that out and if you're God can I tell you something that's bad about being your God and you've got to have the answer and you've got to have it figured out here's the problem you're going to be all alone because you're the only one that's got that answer or trying to find that answer you have to figure it out and you have to get to the bottom of it and if, and if you're God you have to rely on you for everything Galatians is saying no 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 Paul's saying, no, that's not it. You've been set free from that, right? You, you don't have to be God because there's one God. Now, here's the part of the text that I love. So we have been set free for a purpose, right? We've been set free from a purpose. What did it say in verse number one? Stand fast, therefore, in the what? The liberty, or in what? Freedom. We have been set free for freedom. It's for freedom that we've been set free, which means not only have we been saved from something, but we've been saved to something. And what I mean by that, I find in conversations with a lot of people, that's the part that really hasn't sunk in for a lot of believers. That we've been set free to something. God has saved us to something. 
I mean, we freely acknowledge we've been saved from, right? We've been saved from sin. We've been saved from hell. We've been saved from condemnation. We get that, but few people get that we've been saved to. Okay? So what have we been saved to? What have you been saved to? Well, from last week and the week before, in that we have been saved to the freedom of knowing God's love for us does not waver despite my constant failures and shortcomings. And some people never accept that. Matter. You have been saved to the freedom of knowing that God's love for you does not go up if you do good and doesn't tank if you drop the ball. You've been set free from your constant, if we can say it's constant or persistent, shortcomings and failures in our life. We've been set free to enjoy that and set free to walk in that. The best example I can think of, and this is the only one I can think of, is this. I won't ask you if any of your children this week disobeyed you. Okay? I'm not trying to get you bitter in church, okay? Or want to beat somebody. If you're a kid in here, you're like, Phil, don't bring up last week. I'm sorry. Okay? Like that? Pray for me. All right? But well, here's what's happening. Probably nobody in here had their kid forget to take out the trash after you told them three times. And the trash ran. And you got mounds of trash and said, you know what? I'm done with you. Pack your bags. Get out. <laughs> now, you might actually felt that way. You might actually said that. But in reality, nobody did that. You know why? Because they're your kid. You love them. You went through great pains in your life to get them here, to love them, and to keep nurturing because you want to see them grow and to be able to be functioning independent adults as they mature and grow in this thing called life in the world we live in. So why do we think of God who gave his son, his perfect holy son, doesn't love us after we mess up? There's no freedom in that. That runs us right back to fear-based behavior. And there's no freedom in that. And that's what Paul's saying. He says there's no freedom in living that way. If you feel like some future better version of you is the only version God's going to like, then you're not doing it for God and for love and for faith. You're doing it out of fear. And that thing, and we've been set free to pursue at the highest level the pleasures that bring about life and vitality and real living as opposed to being enslaved to a type of pleasure. If we're honest, types of pleasures that leave an aftertaste of guilt and shame, right? If we could boil down freedom into one sentence, it says, freedom is ultimately being able to do what I want most. Being able to do what I want most. So if you try to block people from what they want to do most, they feel that, what, you've taken away some freedom from them, right? So what the Bible just said is, in Jesus Christ, you've been set free in order to walk in freedom to do this, right? So, so let's go and see what he goes on from here. Look at the whole part of verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of freedom, where the Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again or in bondage again with the yoke of bondage. Now, you've been set free to enjoy freedom. He says, therefore, stand firm. Now, what does that mean? Now, we're going to have to be real here for a moment, and I'm just going to be me. I, I say this a lot. Uh, confession is good for the soul, mighty heart on the reputation. But I'm just going to be honest with one another here with this. I find myself drifting sometimes in my life spiritually. I'm just going to be honest with you. I find there's days and there's weeks that I find myself not drifting towards the love of God and that God loves me and accepts me. I find myself drifting the other way. And, and probably you feel the same way. I'll wake up and all of a sudden, I'm back to trying to earn God's goodness because of who I was. Or maybe some things that I've done. And I won't be enjoying freedom. I'm back trying to earn the affection that the Bible has already said is mine to have. And if I could be honest, there are some times that I doubt what God has actually done in setting me free for freedom. There's some times I doubt that. Sometimes I'm like, some of the lies that I find myself believing or God is not ultimately about my freedom, but rather God's about taking, taking from me the freedom that I want. And so what Paul says here in the text is for freedom you've been set free. So stand firm in that. Don't go back into that slavery, right? Don't go back to that. Don't do it. So here's the paradigm shift here in this book. When you get to chapter number five, this idea in studying this is the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for people to be saved with, but the gospel of Jesus Christ saves us and sustains us and carries us in this thing we call life. That's what it is. He doesn't want to just be the Lord of your salvation. He desires and wants to be the Lord of your life. Amen. That means how I raise my kids. That means how I deal with difficulty. 
That's how I deal with my own personal shortcomings that are going to come and come and come and come. It's not a license to sin. It's not a get out of jail free card. What it is, is this idea is this. I'm no longer in bondage. I feel like i got to do all these things to make God happy. Instead, when I go through this, that he says this, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee in those things. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. We don't move on from the gospel. If you hear you say, I've been saved for 50 years, you never move on from the gospel because the gospel is not a one-time act. It's a life in which we live. That's what the gospel is, okay? And I can I tell you, we preach the gospel to ourselves minute by minute, some days, hour by hour, week by week, month by month, year by year. From the moment he wakes up our hearts for the need of salvation to the moment he calls us home, we must stand in the gospel. Yeah. We must stand in the gospel. Yeah. And, and, and I, I need you to hear me in this. Some of us need to stand firm in the gospel because you're running back to slavery. Yeah. You're running back to the bondage and the weight and all those things that happen in it. So, so how does this work itself out? Let me, let me try to explain, teach it a little bit here. Some people are absolutely trying to earn favor with God. And can I tell you, and if you've done that, I've done it in seasons of my life, it is exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting to try to do that. Then others of you, those of you who are wrestling with your flesh. Now, I don't know if you know what I mean by wrestle with flesh, and I don't want to speak too much Christianese here for you and, and lose you. Uh, so if you don't really understand what I mean by wrestle with your flesh, is this, is that when God saves you, God gives you a new heart, all right? Gives you a new heart. And then, with that new heart, God calls us and sanctifies us to make us, what? Holier and holier and more like him. So what that means is this is holiness is where we get, we get this holiness, where we get saved, and he moves us over to where he wants us to be. So I get saved, but over here is where God wants me to be holy as he is holy. <coughs> And this big gap between our hands, that's where the struggle is. I would love to tell you, I got saved and I never struggled with anything that I've ever struggled before in my life with. And I'll never struggle with anything. It's just a great. But sanctification or being like Christ and allowing Christ to change in you and work in you, it's a messy, it's a violent process. The Bible says arms, excuse me, iron sharpeneth iron. Can I tell you, that's not a gentle process. That's a violent process. It's a hard process. So this part of me going from saved now to where God wants me to be and how holy God wants me to be, this is the struggle. This is the struggle. And this is what it means. I'm battling the flesh, right? That's what this gap is. And it's really strong in a lot of us, okay, with that. But maybe not all of us, but I think in me it's struggle with a lot of us. And it's in the process of God taking us from where we're at to more and more, not like the old person we are, not like that former life, but who do you desire us to be? And can I tell you, there are days, weeks, months, and hours when it feels like a simple desire in my heart is so overwhelming that it's impossible for me to say no to it. And maybe you're the same way. The Bible says we all have those sins that easily beset us, right? But Paul is saying, no, stand firm in the gospel. You believe the gospel in that moment. And what's happening is he's saying some of us are struggling in that, right? And even today, some of you have come in here today. And you're coming here today, and maybe you're great, and things are great in your life. you got victory in your life. And some of us may have found our way in this room this week, and, man, we're struggling. Man. And you say, do you need to know what I'm struggling with? Absolutely not. It's not between me and you. It's between you and God. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there's times in our life we put people in our life for certain reason to help us, give us accountability. I, I believe that's possible. I don't think Facebook is where your accountability needs to be. Okay? <laughs> I do think God places different people, but what I'm saying is there are things in our lives that we struggle with. If you're in here and say, well, I don't struggle with anything, well, I'm going to really start praying for you because you just invited <laughs> the devil to say, bring it. We all struggle with things, right? We all struggle with things. We begin to doubt sometimes whether God is for our freedom. We begin to doubt whether or not it's freedom. He sets you free. We wrestle in those things. We struggle in those things. And a lot of times, if we're honest, we begin to slide from freedom and our joy when we start to slide and doubt God for who God is. You begin to feel as though God is some sort of overlord who's trying to make you into something you don't want to be. And Galatians is saying, no, 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 stand firm. Don't get back under that yoke of bondage, right? Don't put that thing back on. You are set free for freedom. And look where he takes us next. Verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now again, I think we need to talk. And if you're 
not real familiar with what the Bible is saying here, you probably thought that was really strange. Okay, but if you don't have a lot of background in church, you're like, what is he talking about? Circumcision to the Jews, and that's who he's really addressing these people here, the Jews, was this external action that they thought brought them closer to God. By doing this action to themselves, they thought that made them holier, that made them better than other people. Okay, by doing those external things. If I could, can I do this? It was kind of like the Pharisees. You remember that Jesus talked about the Pharisees? It was never good. But what did the Pharisees constantly do? They prayed out loud on street corners for everybody to hear them. They, when they gave money to help the poor, they announced it publicly what they did. When they fasted, meaning they didn't eat things because of things, they would let everybody know what they're doing. It's the idea of this. I want to bless people, but I want other people to know I bless people. And can I just help you with a little bit of something here on the side note? If God lays on your heart to do something to be a blessing to someone, let God bless you. Don't seek other people's blessing. Because either God will bless you or other people will. And I like you a lot. I really God bless me. I really God do that. The Bible says don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Right? To do it in such a way in that. And the idea of here, what he's talking about in verse number two, they changed the idea of God accepting you. Instead, what they said, religion is not from the inside and God working from the inside out. They're saying, instead, what it is, we got to do all this outside stuff and eventually God will change the inside. And what they ultimately did is they put salvation in their ability. In their ability. So they would do this external thing for themselves and then they would be right with Jesus because that goes back to what? Jesus plus, right? It goes right back to Jesus plus something. That was their argument. And Paul's about to turn that on their head. Look back in verse 2. Behold, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor or a slave to do the whole law. Christ has become of none effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, now here's what he says. He says, if you, Paul is saying, if you don't want to be under grace, you don't want to be like your salvation and the way you live your life now as a believer is by the grace of God. If you want to be under the law again, you want to go back to having to do the Ten Commandments perfect and do all that stuff. If you want to be back to being underneath the law, then the moment in that time, Christ was no effect for you. You don't even need a Christ. Because you think you can save yourself by your behavior, right? You don't need a Savior. And then he follows up with a word of warning. I don't know if you picked up around verse 4. He says this, but just so you know, if you feel like you're justified by the law, he says there's something you need to know. You're obligated to keep all of it. He says you can't do the buffet. If you feel like you're saved by your works and doing good things, he says you're a debtor to have to keep it all, all the time. And we all know that's impossible. That's impossible, right? And so why some of us like the law because we think it makes us feel good. But if we're honest, if you think it's good works that helps you stay in right standing with God, we kind of pick laws like this, right? So today I'm going to take this on. We're going to treat it like a buffet. You know what? I'm not going to lie today and I'm not going to covet. I'm not going to lie today. I'm not going to covet. I'm going to do really well with that today. I want to put that on. I'm not going to lie today. I'm not going to covet. But tomorrow I'm going to need to lie a little bit. I'm going to leave covet because Bob got that promotion and I really wanted that promotion. So I'm going to say some things about Bob that aren't true because that's really what I deserve and need. So today, yesterday I didn't lie and covet. Today, okay, I just won't murder anyone today. Okay, I just won't do that. And the Bible goes on and on and says, no, no, no. If you, Paul is saying, if you want the, if you want the law to save you, if you want the law to make you feel good about your standing with God, then you have to get all of it right all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. My kids, when they were little, they're no longer little. Okay, but when they were little. Uh, they would always run up to me and want me to hold them. They would always say, hey, Daddy, pull me, pull me, hold me. And I would always like to do this. I would spin them around, and I would act like I was getting on their back, like they had to hold me. And, and so, you know, they would laugh a little bit. I would put a little bit of weight on them, you know, and they would laugh and giggle and, and, and all those kind of stuff. And there, can I just tell you, though, there would be no laughter if I put my full weight on them because we'd both be in the floor, right? Right? I mean, I'm not a big guy. I'm about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, I weigh about 170 pounds, but they're three years old at that time, right? Although they might be able to hold up a little bit of me for a moment, they're not able to withstand the full weight of my body, okay? Because it would crush them 
Can I tell you what the law and feeling like you have to do everything perfect for God to love you, accept you, and hear you? It's going to crush you. Amen. Because you can't do it. Remember the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to reveal that you need a Savior. The law is an x-ray. It reveals to you what's broken. The x-ray doesn't heal. It just reveals. And that's what the law does. It reveals that you need a Savior. It reveals those things to you. And so you need, we have to understand that. We're not so disciplined. We're not so moral. We're not so upright that we can do all of it on our own. Okay? And that's what Paul's saying. When you do this, he's baffled. He's perplexed. He's like, he says, I, I don't understand what's hindered you. He said, because you're making a dumb trade. You're leaving the grace of God that has forgiven you, accepted you of who you are, put the righteousness of Christ on you, and will carry you and sustain you through life. And you're trading that to go back to having to do this and have to do that and have to do this and have to do that for God to be right with you. And he says, that's dumb. That's dumb. And he's basically saying there's not a more spectacular idea in all the universe than grace. I want to encourage you to remember that about grace because grace does this. It freely acknowledges our failures. It does not try to gloss over our shortcomings. You need to understand that. Grace acknowledges our failures. It does not gloss over our shortcomings. Grace acknowledges they're there. Grace acknowledges you fall short. Grace acknowledges that you're going to continue to fall short. Grace acknowledges that there's going to be struggles of where you are, what's behind you, and what's coming for you. But what grace does, it acknowledges it while it covers it and enables you. That's what grace is. There's going to be shortcomings in failure, but let me enable you to get past that, to be holy as he is holy, to go on with that. Can I tell you, the beautiful thing about grace is this, that grace comforts you. Grace is a comfort. The law is never meant to be a comfort. It was never meant to be a comfort. See, grace is a comfort because it says it's God has paid the bill, you're holy, you're spotless, and you're loved of God. And the law will never whisper that to you. It will never tell you you're okay. The law is always going to tell you you don't measure up. The law does nothing but point out your shortcomings. And grace will let you know you have shortcomings. But it covers those shortcomings. And there's a sweetness to grace pointing out what we mess up. Where it shows us those things. Okay? The idea of grace is this idea that says, I acknowledge you have shortcomings, but I've made a way. And I delight in you. And I love you. And I forgive you. And that's why Paul says he's perplexed. That's why Paul is saying, why would you make this trade? Why would you leave that to go back to slavery and have to do everything yourself? But look in verse 4. Again, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay, so let me be real honest with you because some people read that passage, and it's a great thing about doing um, expository messages. You say, what do you mean by expository? We go through a book of the Bible, we go verse by verse, line by line. We don't skip over stuff, right? Well, that doesn't sound fun, let's skip it. That's, that makes it hard, but it also makes it where it is what it is. So when I read that part, you are falling from grace. I know some of you are pinging right now. So the question in the Bible is never this. Can you lose your salvation? That's never the question in the Bible. But rather, were you saved to begin with? That's right. That's the question. See, when you read this, oh, you're falling from grace, I guess I can lose my salvation. Can I tell you, the Bible is very clear that you can have these spiritual experiences in your life. And you can even have seasons of your life that you like the idea of Jesus and like church and maybe be passionate about it, but not know him, love him, and follow him and be in a relationship with him. And let me give you one verse. I know there's many verses. I know some of you might think, man, Phil, go to Hebrews 6. But I'm just going to read this verse in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 19. 1 John 2, 19 says this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Okay? So, to understand that, what the Bible teaches about salvation is this. If you are truly a child of God, it's not that you will be perfect, but you will persevere to the end. You'll persevere to the end. And where you are not truly converted, you will not persevere. So let, let me have just a frank conversation with you a little bit. So let's just say 
15 years from now, you see me, I say, I don't care about God. I don't care about church. I don't care about any of that. And I live the rest of my life saying, I care less about God. I don't believe the Bible. Don't believe it. And I go on for the rest of my life like that. I want nothing to do with Jesus. Can I just tell you that maybe in this whole season of my life was probably just a lie. I felt obligated to do it. You say, no, Phil, you're a preacher. You've got to be saved. Can I tell you how many people I know Amen. who do the things that I do because they feel like it's the right thing to do? Amen. And maybe this will make God happy and accepted them, but don't have a relationship with them. This doesn't save me. That's right. To be honest, what this does is drive me more and more to how God really sees me and how much I had the need for, for Him. So I would encourage you, if that happens, and I, I pray it never happens in my life, because I feel, I feel in my heart and I know because of evidence in my life that I'm a child of God. I know that. But can I tell you that when we understand that the question is really not can you lose your salvation, the question is did you ever have it to begin with? Again, that goes back to, oh, I said a prayer. Remember who you used in that phrase? I said a prayer. I did action. Christ saved me. That's a difference there, right? So the Bible's pretty clear where it talks about this idea that you can't take anything out of the hand of God. Now I can tell you, you can't lose your salvation if you're saved, but you you can, cannot be saved and pretend that you are. And maybe you've done that. I've known people. I have known people who were Sunday school teachers, youth group workers, preachers. Yes. That even later in life, even during their ministry, had to get up and say, you know what? I've never, ever trusted Christ as my Savior. <clears throat> I knew about God. I had a knowledge of God, but I had no heart. I had no relationship with Him. And you know what a lot of them would say? For years, I never would have ever come to faith in Christ because I greatly feared what would people say. And you know what my response is every time? They always say, glory, hallelujah, that God loved you and showed you grace so much in spite of you and who you are. He showed you that you were a fraud and that you needed him so he could save you, change you, and make you the way he wants you to be. And if I may just for a moment lean on you enough, and some of you that are new, I've not built that trust up in you yet, but if I could lean on you enough to say, it doesn't matter how long you've been going to church, it doesn't matter if you've been baptized. It don't matter all these different things. I don't care what part of any church you are. The question is this. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Not do you just know about it? You say, Phil, I have led people to the Lord. That's not what I ask. Do you know it? If you had a meeting, which one day we are, do you know him? I just know about him. The question is not can you lose your salvation? The question is, are you really saved? Have you ever been saved? Because if you remember in Scripture, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, He talks about it. He says, Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not in thy name done many marvelous works? God, have we not done this in your name? Have we not done this in your name? And you remember what He says? He said, I'm going to look at them and say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. For why? I never knew you. He doesn't say, Because you didn't do this. Then. He says, you never accepted me. That's right. You kept wanting to be God. You kept wanting to be your own Savior. You kept wanting the works and those things to do. So I encourage you today, if you don't know Christ, know Him. Know Him. Accept Him. Know Him. The gift is there. If He's wooing you in your heart, know Him. The Bible says to make your calling and election sure. As Rachel's grandpa, Dr. Sells, used to always say, when it comes to your salvation and the assurance of it, drive it a mile deep in the ground. Drive it a mile deep so when the storm does come, you know that your Redeemer liveth, as Job said, in the midst of everything that he faced. And everything that he faced. And the Bible just teaches that justification comes from God. All of it comes from God in those things. Now, this next part here, and I know our time's about up, <coughs> that we see here. If you notice in, this situ in verse number 5, look what it says. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now, as I said earlier in understanding this, when it comes to you being saved, whether you grew up in church, man, you were born, your mom was in the nursery, faithfully working. I mean, she gave birth to you at church, your first birth with Jesus. I mean, that's how it grew up for you. Or whether you were born in a bar. <laughs> Can I tell you, that doesn't make you any more 
say the wolf, I can say that like that. Okay? It doesn't matter if you have addictions in your past or whether or not you've been as clean as clean can be in your life. That doesn't make you more that Jesus goes, oh, I'd rather have him or rather have her. It is solely by the gift of God that we are saved, not by our works, not by our righteousness. And the Bible puts it on that. And I don't know if you notice this, and if you circle things in your Bible, this is something that you need to understand. That's what he means when he's talking about verse 6. It doesn't matter about circumcision or uncircumcision. If he says, but what? He says, but what? But by what that counts? Faith. That work of love. So if you underline things, that's a big thing right there. Why does God love you? Not because of who you are or who you were or what, where you came from. It's by faith that works through love. And let me tell you why that's a big deal. Look at the next verse. He says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey what? The truth, right? So the only thing that counts is not your external moral behavior, but the only thing is faith that works through love. And he says, you ran well. What does he mean by running well? He says, you were obedient. You were following God. You were loving God. You were doing all this. You were obeying. And he says, who hindered you? What hindered you? And you see this argument that he has here is this, is that the idea is that what's kept you from doing that? And the answer is that is fear-based modification. They got back to doing things they had to do because they were scared that's the only way God would make, be happy with them. And the idea is that we're going to keep falling short, but what he says is that you're going to fall short, but what faith does, faith works through love, and that helps you from running unhindered. This means that the motivation for you and for me to be like Christ, to go to church, to do the things we should in our families, should be what? Fear? No, it should be faith. It should be faith. If we'll be honest, some of us raise our children in such a way because we're scared of how they're going to turn out. Instead of just raising them to the best that we can under, the, under God's leading and having faith that when they leave that house, you know what? I hope I've not just taught them what a Christian should do, but I've taught them who Christ is and how they can have a relationship with him. So is it better if my kids know not to cuss, or is it better if my kids know how to pray and talk to God on their own? You said both. Great, I'm with you. Okay, great. But some of us focus so much more on I hope they do this and I hope they don't do this, and we never teach them how to actually talk to God when they have a problem. How to read this book rather than read it just for <coughs> or reading it because I'm supposed to read it but reading it because they want God to speak to them and give them something that will help them in that day and that week and that time can I tell you as I'm learning very quickly my time with them is very short and you that have already had children leave understand that but do we want our children to fear God or love God the answer to that is both but what I mean by that is this I don't mean fear is terror is the idea that I better go to church Sunday or mama's going to get me or dad's going to get me. The idea is that I respect God because he's a holy God and I love him and I want to do those things. Amen. I want to do those things. I want to love him. I want to pursue him. I want to do those things. You know, I want to do those things and that idea. I, I, I give it to you like this. You know, I, I'm a married man and I do all the things. I, I would say I do things because I love my wife. I don't always do things because I love to do them. Okay? I don't, I don't always do things because I love those things. I try to do those things because I love my wife. So uh, here this week, we're going to be apart a little bit. Rachel's going to go. Uh, we got a funeral tomorrow. She's going to go to South Carolina early. And so she's going to go there, and uh, she's going to be gone. And I have learned. And guys, if there's anything you need to do, is you need to learn. Okay? With some things. I've learned that when she comes back home, you want to know the thing that just, just really hurts her, grates her? is to have a sink full of dishes and a counter full of dishes like that. I mean, I can vacuum. I can paint walls. It does not matter. That sink is it, man. You know what that is. So you know what I've learned? I've learned to ask Rachel, tell me when you're an hour from the house. Okay, so what I've learned is this. Okay? I'm running through rooms. Why in the world? There are cereal bowls here with things growing in them. Okay, we get all these things out. We do those things. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that when she walks through that door, if she sees that done... Man, it gives her a joy, right? Gives her a happiness, right? Gives her some joy in those things. Now, I don't do those things because I love them. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. God did not give me the spiritual gift of, oh, 
Please let me wash dishes today. In fact, please. I want every kid to use four cups a day in the house. Please. And let me do that. That's not where I live. But you know what? I do it because of the joy. But I could do this. I could say, man, we're going to clean these dishes because if she comes home, man, she's going to turn into the Hulk and she's going to kill me and the kids. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Does the job get done? Yes. In both. But where's her joy at? Do it because I love her, not because I'm scared she's going to turn into the Hulk. And this is where freedom is. Whenever I do the things that I do for my wife because I love my wife, it gives me freedom to enjoy those things and it doesn't become another chore. The things in your life that God lays on you to do or not do, you know what freedom is? God, I love you. You want me to do this? You want me to do this? I'll do this. You don't want me to be a part of this? Okay, I won't be a part of this. But when you love God, it gives you the freedom to actually have joy in things you would not normally have joy in. Can we all just say relationships are hard? Mm -hmm. It's a hard to love some people. It's hard to do that. Sometimes it's hard to love people. Can't imagine, though, sometimes it's hard to love me. I don't like that. But the idea is this. When you love something, you're willing to sacrifice for it, to give for it, sacrifice your time, your talent, your treasure. And here's the idea. It's not all about you then. You want to know if you're your own God? Do you do the things you do because it affects you? Or do you do the things you do because you love God, love people, want to serve people? What did Jesus say? You can hang all the law and all the prophets on this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. But if you've got to be the one in charge, and it's all about you. God, let's be honest with you. You're being your own God. And you're probably not living in freedom. You're probably living a little bit of a fear-based idea. And God says through his word, through Paul, he said, that's not where you need to be anymore. For freedom, Christ has set you free. So let's walk in that. If you will, let's stand together. When your head's bowed and eyes closed just for a moment, I just want to give you maybe some moments there of just quietness for you. I know we're going to pray here in a moment. We're going to leave. And if we're honest, for a lot of us, it's uh, it's going to get really busy. It's going to get really busy here when we leave. you got your week, you got Thanksgiving, you got the holidays, and next thing you know, we're going to be in the new year. But maybe just stop for a moment in the midst of this and just ask yourself, why do you do the things that you do? If Christ has saved you, he has set you free for freedom. To enjoy the things that come in life. Can I tell you, you'll never enjoy peace if you've got to be the one that always has the answer in the trial. You'll never have joy in your life if everything's got to be based on your circumstances. But he sets you free from things, but he sets you free to things, and that's freedom to love him, chase him, pursue him, even when it doesn't make sense. And maybe you're here today. Now, I know it took a moment on this. But do you really know him? Do you really have a relationship with him? If you had to stand before God today and he says, what should I do to allow you into heaven? Will you bring out this list of things that, you have, that you've done? Or you say, I have my trust and I believe in Jesus Christ. him and love for people <coughs> rather than do it for people. There's a joy that can be found there, freedom in that.
We had Mr. Daniel Patrick. He he prepared a sermon for the <coughs> teens, and in the middle of his his sermon, I remember that in May we I can't cry every week, y'all. I can't do it. <laughs> but um, in May, right before Isaac and I got married, we asked all the teens to um write down on a note card if they had any questions for us that they would like answered personally before we really had a routine of who was speaking every week um because we're you know in, in the in-between stages <clears throat> with youth pastors and things but anyway turtle sanders walked up to me with her question her card and it was supposed to be anonymous but Turtle did not care about being a nun. Oh, cool. She walked right up to me and she handed me that card. And she said, here's my question. I said, okay, so this is the only reason why I know um, this was her question. Um, but I, I wanted to share it with y'all. I shared it with the teens on Wednesday. Um, anyway, her question was, how do you get motivated to have a relationship with God or to grow your relationship with God? Um, and that was very convicting and also really funny because Turtle did, did not care <laughs> if she, she probably would have asked that question, raised her hand, um, and asked everyone because she was, she was not afraid um, to share who, <laughs> who had her heart. Um, anyway, I just felt led to share that with everyone since I shared it with the teens. Um, let's, let's Thank you. It all goes back to love. Why do we do the things that we do? Because we love God or because we're here for not here. I appreciate you sharing that, Maggie. Let's close in a word of prayer. And again, thank you for being here. And again, we'd love for you to be a part of what we got going on tonight at 6 o'clock, but also next Tuesday. Don't forget about Tuesday and, and next Sunday. With that, don't forget the sign up sheets in the back there, too. Father, we come to you again. We thank you for all that you are. Thank you, God, for the grace. Lord, there's always more grace in Christ than there is sin and shortcomings in us. And Lord, we thank you for that. Yes. Lord, thank you that not only you forgive us of our shortcomings, but you love us enough to us work through them so we can be like you. Lord, I pray we might live our lives as believers, not based and driven off fear. But because I got a God who loves us, forgave us, and saved us. Lord, be with everyone as they go through their week. Lord, I pray is all the pressures and emotions and everything that will come, maybe with being with family. I pray, God, you just help us in the midst of that to remember who we are in you. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.